There is an expression that when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Being diagnosed with a neurodegenerative disease such as Parkinson's is far more than lemons, and Tim Haig has done much more than make lemonade. He's lived, really lived an inspiring life, doing everything from winning the Amazing Race Canada to founding the charity U-Turn Parkinson's, and now he's written a memoir. It's called Perseverance, the seven skills you need to survive, thrive, and accomplish more than you ever imagine. And Tim Haig joins us now. Hi. Hi, ma'am. I'm a big fan of the Amazing Race Canada, so it's nice to have you here. Well, thank you. I, uh, I am too. Well, let's talk about uh, the crux of the book, which is Parkinson's disease. Yes. Uh, what is Parkinson's disease? Parkinson's is a progressive and chronic neuro neurodegenerative disease that results in a decreased production of dopamine in the substantia nigra portion of the brain. Got that? Yeah, I know. I say that <laughs> like five times fast. <laughs> uh, in simple terms, it's a neurodegenerative. It's a nerve disease of the brain that will get worse with time. It's progressive, it gets worse, it's chronic, but it results in the decreased production of that chemical, dopamine, which we need for movement. Dopamine is the chemical, go, chemical that gives us that runner's high, makes us feel good, but we also need it to move properly. Mm -hmm. And uh, Parkinson's is typically known by its, the tremor, the rigidity, the slowness, the loss of balance, those motor symptoms that we often talk about, there's lots of others, but those, those are your classic ones that people often think about, the tremor and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And by the time that tremor develops, we've lost about 80% of the production of dopamine in our substantia nigra, which is right in the middle of our heads, underneath the thalamus, and doesn't get produced anymore. So that's kind of a long answer to what is Parkinson's. So at the loss of that dopamine comes all of those symptoms. Uh, and I, I know I'm going, you probably know more about Parkinson's disease than most people, but you were a nurse before you were diagnosed, yes, right? Yes. And you uh, got the diagnosis when you were 46? 46. Uh, so back in 2013, you and your son, Tim Jr., yes. um, were the winners of the first season of The Amazing Race Canada. Uh, we have a clip of, to show of you crossing the finishing line. Awesome. Uh, Sheldon, please roll. Tim Sr., what do you think your success on this show is going to show Canadians? And I would hope that if anything, I could be an inspiration to young onset Parkinson's, just to simply get off your ass. Get up and move. Don't let this disease take your life away. My dad has completely blown every expectation of him out of the water. Parkinson's isn't supposed to let you do half the things that he's done in this race. And he not only did them, he kicked their butt, man. Um, what even possessed you to join the Amazing Race in the first place when you had Parkinson's? My wife. Uh, she was an absolute fanatic of the show, still is. Mm -hmm. Had watched all the American shows and said, if it ever comes to Canada, we're going to apply. And the long and short of it is, after she looked at it, realized that she and I couldn't be gone because we still had young children at home. She insisted that my son and I apply because she said, I guarantee you, you're going to get an interview. They're going to love your Parkinson's. And she, she was right. We're going to talk more uh, about that, but uh, something that was said in that clip that we just showed, yeah. um, the message of get up and move. Um, in the six years since that moment of you winning the Amazing Race Canada and everything that came with it, um, how have you continued to get that message of get up and move out to people with Parkinson's? Well, I hope a lot of it's by example. Um, my daughter and I just ran the hypothermic half marathon in Winnipeg. Um, so you're taking it easy. We did. <laughs> and I should say we did back in the winter. Uh -huh. uh, we, we ran the half and we try to, we try to set an example of what, what we can do. For a long time I had given up running or running was taken from me because I got really severe cramps. My toes would curl under and various things and I simply couldn't run. But because of some medications I was put on and whatnot, the cramps have gone away. And so we've chosen to try to live what we teach in the book, take mm -hmm. every advantage and now my body will let me run again. Mm -hmm. So I try to live, it, live the example of there are things we can do mm -hmm. and do what you can do. Not that everybody needs to be a runner, they don't need to do what I do, but there are things we can do to push ourselves, to push the envelope a little bit. And why do you do that? Because the, the research has proven, proven, it's not a matter of speculation, it is scientific fact that exercise is as good, good for us as our medication is. And if we will get out and exercise, we will see a better symptom control with our Parkinson's in a variety of ways. And they even speculate that it may slow the disease down. So I just ask people, are you willing to take your medication? 
because if you're willing to take your pills every morning, you should be willing to get up and do some form of exercise every day because it will make a difference. Well, let's take um, a step back in time and talk a little bit about your childhood. Okay. Um, yeah. I just want to read something that you wrote in the book. Um, you write, I was born a half-breed into a very black and white world. What does one do with a biracial, as we were called, baby in 1964? You put up a free-to-good home ad and see if you get any takers. Mm. In an attempt to avoid having to raise me in an orphanage, I was taken from church to church, put on display, and offered to anyone who was willing. I'm told that it wasn't quite as dramatic as it seems, and that, in fact, it didn't take long until my parents and I found each other. Um, when I was reading that, uh, I noticed something shift in your eyes. How, how are you feeling hearing that? It's a cool story. At least it is to me, because... Uh, in 1964, there were not a line of people out the door looking to adopt biracial babies. And I still am amazed that parents came along, a couple, a white couple came along who was willing to not only adopt me, but five more like me, in addition to the three kids that they already had. And it's a, it's a cool thing. Mom and dad are awesome people. Do you, even in living in that world at home, um, you write that inside it was safe and you mm -hmm. felt accepted. But what was it like to go out into the world with white parents, as you say, in a very black and white world? Yeah, we caused a stir whenever we went out together. <laughs> you know, mom and dad trailing six biracial kids behind them always caused a sensation. Mm -hmm. And everywhere out there was always a challenge. Because like I say in the book, you know, um, I was always too white for the black man's daughter to date too black for the white man's daughter and the wrong shade of brown for the Latino man's daughter. And fathers would tell me, you need to find your own kind to date. Well, in 1970s and 80s, who was my kind? They, they didn't exist. So as unsafe and unfitting as we felt often out there, mm -hmm. at home, we always felt safe. Well, how did your parents help you navigate that world outside? I think they helped us most out there by what they did here. They always were the, were the grounding, they were the root, they were the anchor that always said, no matter what happens out there, you are always accepted here. No matter how much we might screw up, how much trouble we might get into or whatever, there was never any question that they loved us and loved us unconditionally and matter of fact. And that made all the difference when you face something out there that was hard, you always knew that mom and dad had your back. Mm -hmm. It was always good back home. So the difference was that you knew that you were loved. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. And this was in the States. Uh, yeah. But you, so you end up getting married to a young woman from Winnipeg, Peg yeah. City, Holla. Yeah. <laughs> and you met her in uh, Bible school, right? That's right. Um, and you and Cheryl eventually moved to Winnipeg. Cheryl is your wife's name. Yes. Um, how challenging was that move for you? Oh my, I hated Winnipeg. Mm. The first two years that I lived there, I would have given my eye teeth to get out. What was, what was challenging? It was minus 40 <laughs> all winter that year. Like, it was cold. Winnipeg is what everybody thinks it is. It's cold. It is. But I thought I understood that moving, moving there. I thought I understood Winnipeg. We had been married for four years. We had been back and forth lots. You know, these folks lived in the same houses we do. They spoke the same language that we do. They go to the same McDonald's that we do. Mm -hmm. Turns out we're nothing, well, we're, there's lots of ways that we're not alike, Americans and Canadians. So that first couple of years was huge culture shock, and it was just tough. It was just downright hard. And uh, in the book, you write about a story where you're washing dishes one day, oh, yeah. looking outside, yeah. and then you see... Can you tell us the story? Well, I, I'm standing washing dishes September 21st, 1989, and I, I see this stuff in the air, and I ask my wife, is something burning? And she says, what do you mean? There's ash in the air. There's, or is there some kind of tree that, that's producing something because it shows she walks over to the window, laughs and says, sweetheart, it's snowing. I'm like, I did not know that it snowed in summer in Winnipeg. <laughs> Autumn, fall. <laughs> uh, September 21st, still pretty much summer in Kansas. That was pretty shocking. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, after you moved to Winnipeg, uh, you had a child, yes. uh, Tim Jr. Um, you decide to go back to school. Um, how did you end up in nursing, which as you put in the book, you initially saw as quote unquote, a girl's job. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry gals, I did, yeah. I have to admit it. Um, mom was not a nurse, but she cared for elderly folks in our home for years. So I was very familiar with a lot of the work that nurses do. 
At 27 years old, I found myself married with a child and basically unemployable. I had no real post-secondary except some Bible school. That time in life had come to an end, and I didn't know what to do. So I started hunting. And my brother-in-law, Brad, says to me one day, have you ever considered being a nurse? I'm like, no. <laughs> but he was going into physio. And the more we talked about it and the more I started thinking about it, I thought, I know this. Mm -hmm. I'm familiar with this. I should look more into this. And so as I did, I saw that it was two-year diploma, good pay when you come out, portable, could go back to the States if I wanted to or anywhere in the world. And the more I looked at it, the more I liked it. How did that decision change your life? It changed everything. It was the best career decision I, I think I could have ever made because I love working with people. I love being a bedside nurse. I love that nitty gritty, dirty stuff that everybody else says, how in the world do you do that? Because it is, nursing is, is one of those things that so few people on the planet would do, that will do for one another. Mm -hmm. We find ourselves in some of the most personal, intimate, uh, places with people that so few are willing to go. And to be able to manage that professionally and to help people in some of their most difficult moments has been some of the most meaningful work that I will probably ever do. And what role do you think you being a nurse had in help to diagnose uh, yourself with uh, maybe seeing like that something was wrong? Because someone, somebody else, if that happened to them, they might not think it's anything. Sure. Sure. I mean, mine was, I, I self-diagnosed really early. I mean, I just had a small tremor in my left big toe, but I knew, I knew that wasn't normal. I knew that something was causing that. If not stress, then something physiological. And then dad had passed away with Parkinson's. I had a half sister, I have a half sister with MS. And I knew that it was probably one of those two things. Mm -hmm. And that hearkened, but not only to their experience, but just knowing from my medical background that this isn't normal. But that must have been, what was that moment like? Because in the book you write that you're sitting having a coffee yeah. um, and then your toe starts to tremble. Yeah. What was that moment like uh, to think that maybe it was Parkinson's? It was very, uh, you're rattled, right? You're not quite sure what to think. You don't want to believe it. You don't want to think that you could be right about this. But again, you know that there's no reason for your toe to be twitching. That's not a right thing to have happening. Mm -hmm. So I just decided to do what every good husband does and do nothing. Ignore <laughs> it. <laughs> until, yeah. until you're halfway around the world and then you tell your That's wife right. what you're thinking. Um, you've talked about some of the symptoms and some of the symptoms that we're familiar with are the tremors or shakiness. Mm -hmm. um, but you also write about what you call the non-motor symptoms of the disease. Um, can you explain what those are? Sure. There are lots of things that people don't see about this disease. And I, I like to say that Parkinson's is well known, but poorly understood. Uh, because people typically see that tremor. They often see the rigidity, the slowness, the loss of balance. They don't tend to see the anxiety, the depression. Uh, one that I like to talk about is mild cognitive impairment, which I have. It doesn't mean that I'm demented or have Alzheimer's or anything like that. Mm. It means that you can't process large volumes of information anymore. You can't multitask. And uh, I was a nurse, of course, uh, working as a manager. I had over 200 employees at the time when I retired. Mm -hmm. And it's that, that ability to have multiple emails coming in every day, mm -hmm. multiple phone calls coming in every day, a code happening down the hall, and all of the stuff that goes on and being able to prioritize that in your head, hold it, and respond to it. And I just simply can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, it's to the point where my wife says, you want to go for supper? And then she lists six options. It's, it's simply overwhelming. And it's not easy to admit that uh, because those are things that, as a guy, you, you want to be in control of your life, right? You want, you want to be believe that you can juggle those 12 balls like you always could and add a couple more to them. But the simple fact is, is that if you give me too much too fast... Everything ev falls. Everything seizes. Mm. It just seizes up, and, and you literally cannot process it. What was that like for you to come to that realization that you couldn't do it all? Oh, that's tough. Mm -hmm. Because I always was that guy that could juggle 12 balls and look for two more. Um, I could give a speech verbatim from memory, no notes, mm -hmm. always. I always have notes now. I have been in the middle of speeches that I've given 
dozens and dozens of times and for, literally forget where I'm going. And it's just the way our minds work now. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the way it is. And it, it's frustrating because people don't see these things. They don't associate these things with Parkinson's. They think, oh, you have a tremor, oh, you're slow. If it were just that, Parkinson's would be a cakewalk for me. Mm -hmm. But there are so many more things. The fact that it often affects people's uh, bowels mm. and they end up unable to process their food. They literally can't eat and process their food because of their Parkinson's. Mm. It is a nasty disease that can affect people in just horrible ways. And you said that um, it's something that you know that's not going to stop. It's just going to get worse with time. That's right. And that realization must be what? It, uh, there's a couple ways I would explain that. A buddy recently said, you know, it's not a death sentence. It's a life sentence. Mm -hmm. And there's a downside to that. Because there's a part of your brain that says it would almost be better if you knew you had cancer. You got five years. You, they give you a prognosis of five years. You go make the best of those five years and go for it. Versus a death of a thousand cuts where this is gonna last the rest of my life, every day, nonstop. Because even when the tremor does, isn't there, it never leaves. It's always there. Every day that you wake up and you're a little bit stiffer, you have a little bit more difficulty walking, you wonder, is this the day that I'm gonna have to increase my meds? Mm -hmm. Is this the day I'm gonna have to think about having surgery? Is this the day that I can't do this? There's always another step coming. Always, 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 to the day you die, this will be with you. And that messes with your head. If you don't stay in control of persevering, not living for tomorrow, but living for today, it can overwhelm you. And speaking of perseverance, you, in the book you write that while there's currently no cure for Parkinson's, uh, there are some drug treatments including Levocarb, am I yeah. saying that right, um, which you take. How does that drug, uh, what does that drug do and how well does it do it? If I didn't take Levocarb uh, today, I would be uh, probably not speaking well because Parkin my tremor has gone on to involve my jaw and I, I shake when my meds wear off in my jaw and it causes me to stutter mm -hmm. and whatnot. I have a hard time walking, my toes curl under. I certainly wouldn't be running mm -hmm. because even now when I run, I have to fight to keep my foot relaxed so that it stays uncurled. Um, I wouldn't be able to type. I probably wouldn't be writing at all. My writing is, has always been atrocious, <laughs> but now it's completely illegible. Mm -hmm. I would not do much without these drugs. Mm -hmm. And there are some folks who have had DBS, deep brain stimulation, that would be, they would be in their 40s, 50, and bedridden without it. But with it, they're able to live almost normal lives. Well, let's talk more about uh, The Amazing Race, because I think uh, this is what introduced you to yeah. Canada and to, uh, to the work that you're doing now yeah. in the Parkinson community. Um, so your wife uh, convinced you to apply, and she said, you know, uh, the Amazing Race likes father-son duos, and they, you, the Parkinson's would be something that would make you stand out. Um, and so you write about this. Was I a monkey in a zoo to be put on display? Was I to be ogled like the bearded lady of circuses gone by? I certainly had no desire to be pitied or humiliated. Uh, looking back on the experience of being on the Amazing Race Canada, um, were your concerns about being on display justified at all? The race, the producers at Insight did such a fantastic job of not only portraying Canada, but just telling my story. I always knew they were looking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's quite obvious when a camera's looking at you at your hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's clear that they're shooting my Parkinson's, right? Mm -hmm. But in the end, they did such a wonderful job of respecting me, respecting the disease, and just telling the honest story of what I was living with. And you were kind of anxious in seeing the first uh, episode because oh, yeah. you, in your words, you said that you didn't want to be portrayed as the village idiots. Is that what? That's right. That's and right. what was it like to see that first episode? It was, it was very, I was very anxious. Mm -hmm. uh, we had been asked lots to do viewing parties with the public, and we just said no. Yeah. I could not handle that pressure because I didn't know. I didn't know what the race was gonna to do to me. I didn't know, you know, we won, yes, but 
we lost the entire race until we won. And so I didn't know if we were gonna look like fools the whole time. I didn't know if my Parkinson's was gonna be portrayed as this bizarre thing. Mm -hmm. But, so we got through that first episode with, friend, with family, saw that it was gonna be okay. And then we started doing it with the public. Well, the first challenge, uh, well, in the first episode, uh, you did something that had me shaking in my boots. Uh, let's take a look at that challenge. Sheldon, please roll. I am a little bit nervous about this one. With my dad's Parkinson's and stuff, he gets really, really shaky. Let's go, Pape! You got it, Dad, here we go! You got it, Dad! Man, this guy's my hero right here. <laughs> I'm, I'm really proud of him. I, I mean, anxiety and also like, I feel like I want to cry <laughs> watching that clip. Uh, but in the book, you write that watching this sequence on television was incredibly different from the actual experience. Uh, in what ways? Watching that sequence right now, I was looking again. All you can see is my hand doing this a little bit, right? I felt like I was all over the place. I felt like I was gonna fall off the, off the beam. Uh. And then to watch myself, I was absolutely stunned because it didn't look anything like how I felt. So it makes you self-conscious. Oh, Parkinson's. hugely. But what does it mean to see your son saying that that's my hero? Oh. What dad doesn't want to be a hero to their kid, eh? Mm -hmm. yeah, that means the world. Um, there was a successful moment in your race. Uh, tell us about a challenge where your Parkinson's really got in the way of, of completing a task. Uh, the biggest one was in Iqaluit. Um, we were. We were actually in second place that day. We, we ended in second place. It was after coming in last the day before. But we had done a lot of physical challenges that day. And by the time we got to the end, I was absolutely exhausted. And we had uh, the, the clue said, run a kilometer, find Jonathan Matt. Well, I, I was Jonathan the host, yeah. John the host, yeah. And I was stoked because I thought, I, okay, I've got enough juice in me to run a K. Okay, I can do that. So we get about 500 meters down, turn a corner, and there's John. On top. On top of this hill. And I bet you it wasn't that big of a hill, but it looked like a mountain. It felt like a mountain right then. And the only way I got up that hill that day was because Tim Jr. said, Dad, grab my coat. And I held onto his coat, and he literally pulled me up the hill. And without that, that day, my Parkinson's, I was shaken. I was just freaked out. I, everything was falling apart. And if he hadn't been willing to do that, I don't know where I would have ended up that day. Well, well, your book is called Perseverance, and I think people can easily see how it applies uh, to how you approach the amazing race. Yeah. Uh, how do you think the word fits with Tim Jr.'s experience, your son's experience? Oh, I think he would say that he learned a lot about how to deal with a, a parent with Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. That, you know, our kids, we don't tell them everything, right? Mm -hmm. we, they don't see everything. They're our kids but spending the time that we did together because it's day after day after day, 24 seven, you can't hide from him. He's there, he gets to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And he learned what it meant to persevere, for me to persevere with Parkinson's. And I think that for him, it was a, a new learning of what it means for him as, a, as my kid mm -hmm. to persevere with me and my Parkinson's. And since winning the Amazing Race Canada, uh, you spent a lot of time speaking to various groups about Parkinson's. Um, how different is your message when you speak to people with a condition as opposed to speaking to a general audience? Yeah, you know what, if I'm in a boardroom, a corporate environment, we're talking about how to take the struggles that you face in business and apply these life lessons that I've learned to that mm -hmm. and how you can persevere in the difficulties of work when it looks like there's no way forward, how can you put one more foot in front of the other? What are the secrets and the challenges of those seven skills that you can put in place there and to take your business forward? Mm -hmm. I'm talking to a Parkinson's group. Well, now we're family. Now we can talk about all the aspects of life. How do you deal with that morning that you get up and you don't want to do this anymore. You just don't. You want it all to go away and you're done. Your wife doesn't get it anymore. Maybe your husband leaves. The kids are having a rough time because mom and dad sometimes look odd. And how, how do we handle that? How do we keep going forward when we just don't see a way forward, when we don't see any success in this? Mm -hmm. And what are, the, what are the things that we can employ to not just give, 
don't give up. Like, I've never understood don't give up. What does that mean? Don't give up. Don't give up. Okay, I'm not giving up. What do I do? What do I do? So with perseverance, I've broken it down to those seven skills, and we talk about what can you do to not just survive, but to thrive in space in, in the face of this di disease. Well, what have you learned about yourself through the process of writing this book? I discovered I could write a little. <laughs> <laughs> and you're funny, too. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah, I do say that tongue in cheek, but I'm serious. I mean, I didn't, I didn't plan this. Yeah. I didn't anticipate this. And people have taken a lot from the book that I just, I didn't anticipate. And I've, I've come to really love writing. Um, it's a new medium for me. I've been a speaker for a long time. But I'm finding that I can say things differently through writing than I can through speaking. And I'm, I'm really enjoying it. And I've learned through the whole process that I'm capable of more than I thought I was. I always had a pretty good health, healthy self-esteem. But here again, I'm learning that, you know what, even in dark times, even in tough times, there, there is more that I can do. Well, Tim, it's been such a nice, uh, it's been so nice having you here. Uh, thank you for writing this book. Oh, I think you, it really yeah. helps us understand that your circumstances don't have to determine the quality of your life That's or right. the outcome of your life. That's right. It's been great having you here. Thank you. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.